After taking a look at some of the art department characteristics of some of Martin Scorsese's films, I'd like to examine the production designer's vision as seen through the eyes of Sarah Greenwood, an English production designer who's given us some of uh, the finest films that done in recent years. Here is an example set decoration from one of her movies that she was production designer on, the movie Atonement. This gives you a clear example of the period that this movie is trying to depict. This is the Edwardian going into World War I period in England. And look at how detailed everything is on this desk. It's, it's got the fringed lampshade. It's got the uh, feathered, ostrich feather pen. It's got the vase with the flowers. It's got all the cut glass goblets and perfumery. It's got even the period hairdryer. It's all specific and detailed, but none of it's going to be really seen by us watching the movie. It's just going to be the background. It's going to give us the gestalt of the scene, and it's going to make it very real for us. It's put in a studio. It's set in a set, but just this little depiction of this small section of the room is enough to plunge us into 1914 England, as is this picture here of uh, her design for a dining room or living room in the atonement. This is before the war, upper class, filled with light. The carpet matches, the couches matches, the filigree flowered wallpaper. The clothes itself, it all is a soft and rich and elegant, and it's all very optimistic looking as is this picture here. She has a wonderful a wonderful color sense. Is that the green dress here means or signifies, symbolizes how different she's going to be from everybody else in their formal wear. But I love, look at the flowered wallpaper, the flowered couch, the flowered carpet. Again, flowered patterns everywhere. And it gives us uh, uh, also a sense of, of the time with the, with the portraits in the background. I had a, a mixture of the family portrait with some classical portrait. In other words, the ornamentation bespeaks an upper middle class English household, especially the piano there. As the movie develops, this upper middle class world gets darkened by the war and things fall apart. And so we can see how things suddenly become less elegant, less polished, less separate in the upper portions of our slide here we can see chairs becoming covered with cloths, the, the, the wallpaper being darkened, the bed with garments thrown on it, the flowered sense, uh, the, the flower pot in the, in, the, in the slide next to it. It, it. It's also, the flowers might be pink, but the surrounding wood is darkened, so we can see the change in attitude. And of course, when the war comes in the lower two slides, everything is, is, is desaturated, become blues, browns, darks, pale, uh, skin against the dark tones of war. She designs for the mood of the movie real, really well. And and, and this is, uh, towards the end of the movie, there's the um, Dunkirk scene where the retreat from Europe at, at Dunkirk and the boats coming in to rescue people. This is a sketch that Sarah Greenwood did to depict the scene taken from photographs of the real Dunkirk. So they're creating a town. They're not going to find an on-location town that like, was still existent from 1915, but they, um, they, they, they drew, the, drew the diagram and then they did a little collage here. So you can see how she draws a little and then she collages photos in to let the um, art team figure out what to build in the set deck development. And, and this is what they come up with. They came up with a, a circus uh, kind of on the beach. It's, it's, it's um, an amusement park that's fallen in disrepair and this is where the soldiers have to to, to retreat and get on the boats and flee Europe, but it's it's a nice background to show that the uh, the amusement park is gutted now become a refuge for wounded soldiers, and you can see how she's her drawings have come to life here with the build the car you can see in the upper left everything is situated a little differently the decorators uh, set decoration decided to position it differently for the blocking of the soldiers, but it's still her design as is this part here, we can see that Ferris wheel in the background. It's a wonderful picture of past amusement 
in present despair. The, the grim, dark green soldiers against that light, almost effervescent, almost disappearing Ferris wheel. It's a wonderful image, wonderful uh, production design image. And here at the beach, we can see the silhouette against this, this need to just leave everything behind. And that lonely soldier looking on uh, to the Ferris wheel in the background. It's, just a, it's a wonderful, uh, I don't know if the movie really worked as a story, but her, her production design was excellent. Here she has the soldiers walking against the, the, the tulips here. The, and, and it's just, what a, what, what a scene. We, we got these uh, death figures against the abundance of orange life. And then we got the silhouettes in the next panel. So she balances this, this, this conflict between um, rioting nature and explosive humanity, destructive humanity. Uh, pictures that followed after that, it was actually a series she did for BBC, it was Pride and Prejudice, uh, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, and it, look at how she captures immediately the upper class nature and, and the division between the, um, the, the Jane Austen's characters who are, who are, 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 are teachers and, 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 and nannies and, and the middle class people trying to become upper class, or helping the upper class, they're trying to fit in. And, and, and are ambitious and, and probably more intellectual, but the inherited uh, kingdom of wealth is well established here with the background painting, mural on the wall, this Italianate, Renaissance, Michelangelesque figures of heroic figures on the wall. It's, it's, it's a heroic painting with these columnar Corinthian posts in the background, and, and, the, and the servants dressed like elegant soldiers. And, and, of course, the men with their cutaway coats and the very proud uh, grand dame sitting to the right. And, of course, the uh, tutors and nannies sitting in their more drab uh, clothing to the left. And here in Pride and Prejudice, she gives you the scant example of, of the um, austere, pristine uh, element of the upper class where the servants are standing to the right, almost as if they were figurines that we would have on one of the tables, or we might see in one of the uh, around portraits in the back. It is just so that that people, the the underclass, lower class, are just objects in these people's lives who are sitting at the table here. And it's very, very uh, balanced. This is the rational world. This is the Enlightenment world of of England. So that that even even the art in the backgrounds balance. We have the woman on one side. We have the man on the other side. We have. Uh, at the table, they're, they're balanced. Everything seems to be um, clean and balanced as if there were no passions to interfere. As in this scene here, we have the, the visiting women and we can see the class difference immediately. And we can see how being upper class means that the furniture really isn't comfortable. It isn't really being made to relax in or feel good in. It's being made so that you can demonstrate yourself as if you were a statuesque presentation. And, and so you, you are a statue among statuesque furniture, but nothing seems very comfortable. It's all a presentation of formality, like the chandelier glass, like the paned windows, like that flower arrangement in the back, which is just balanced, right? Uh, and, 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 the, and, the, and the patterns of the floor. It's all made to see, seem as if the presentation is of people who have manners, and attitudes that aren't spontaneous. If we go back to the houses where um, our, our hero heroines live as, as, as lower middle class families who are uh, whose only way of upper mobility is to become a tutor or a nanny or working as um, a teacher uh, instructing the wealthy. We see, look at this house, look at what she does. Sarah Greenwood takes this couch here. It's, it's like obviously not a new couch, it's a well-worn couch. But it looks comfortable. It actually looks like something you could relax in. And so, sure enough, we have people relaxing on it. This is different from that hard, formidable furniture we saw in the upper-class baronial domain. Here we have somebody relaxing. Here we look at a family of people who really work. These, these aren't people. These, this isn't the aristocracy who has leisure. This, these are the working people. She's relaxing on the couch, taking a nap. Here we have that upper mobile woman reading her book by the firelight. We have the dining table, not used for dining, not used with servants giving us 
something. This is used for work. We can see these people either sewing or they're working on their lessons. So this is a house where people are striving through either learning our handicrafts to better themselves in that middle class kind of ambitious 19th century way. And here we have Sarah uh, uh, Greenwood's balance. Here we have the family in, 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 of, of daughters who are all working hard and striving. And the house seems comfortable. It seems human. It seems like it has a personality. And then we have um, uh, the, the, the servants go to the lower, lower class house, but it's also clean and comfortable looking in its own way. But she captures it immediately. She takes the table, and there are no tablecloths. It says a million things right there. Just like that couch, that rumpled, faded couch says so many things. And as an example, an example of, of the upward uh, mobility, uh, the, the striving middle class, we have uh, Donald Sutherland here in that in that um, educational domain where you're in that office and the and the and the books stacked in the shelves and 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 all the the gold locked boxes. It it says that this person is in a position of power that could be granted to this woman. And um, she goes back home and she industriously pursues her own development with this harpsichord and the piano. And again, she pulls away from the leisure of the table to improve herself. Everything that Greenwood does helps the story as decoration to understand what we're talking about.